my name is Ed Finkler. This is Stronger Than Fear Mental Health in the Developer Community. Uh, that is Open Source Bridge 2015. Put a little hashtag, I don't care, you know, use a hashtag or not, whatever, that's fine. Anyway, uh, who am I? Um, well, yeah, my name's Ed Finkler. I'm a dad, I'm a husband and developer type. I've been that way for a long time, about 20 years. Sometimes I'm a musician, kind of big nerd dude. Um, I also have a mental illness or mental disorder, whatever nomenclature you like to use, or actually I got a couple of them. Um, now I'm just a person, I'm not of any uh, learned degrees uh, in these uh, fields. Uh, I am not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, I don't have any kind of certification in that kind of way. Uh, I am certified in mental health first aid, uh, but I don't have any other extensive training in it. Um, but I am here to talk about what it's like to have mental disorder from my perspective, and also talk about kind of generally how that impacts uh, uh, our community. Uh, the general impact of it that it has on the workplace and things like that. So I'm going to do a real informal survey here. And if you've ever seen me do this in the last year, this will probably be old hat to you. But if not, then it's, all, it's new to you. So if you have seen me do it before, pretend you haven't. How many of you need glasses or contacts? Almost everybody. OK, great. Uh, how many of you are afraid to tell people about it? OK, nobody yet. It's good, usually some smart ass who raises their hand when I do that. Um, have you ever had people say to you, you're not trying hard enough when you need glasses? Like, you know, maybe instead of the glasses, maybe you could just squint. Has anyone ever done that to you? OK, no. All right, good. So people don't do that. Pretty common thing that you have to have some sort of assistive device, let's talk, uh, whether it's a, a lens that hangs out here or stuck on your eyeball. I don't know why I would do that. That seems really creepy to me. But um, How about diabetes? Now, I have a, a father and a brother who both have type 2 diabetes, which pretty much means I'm screwed. But um, I, I, have you ever, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm wondering if you're, you will be comfortable talking about somebody or talking with somebody, let's say somebody you work with, uh, about topic of diabetes, you know, whether you have it or whether, oh yeah, you know, I heard Sam has it, or you know, she has it, or something. Would you feel comfortable about it? I want you to raise your hand if you'd say, yeah, I'd feel comfortable talking about that issue. Most people, yeah, some of you didn't, you're supposed to raise your hands, you're not supposed to look at me and nod. That's not, not getting off to a great start. Um, <laughs> most people are comfortable with it, yeah, right. Um, now, okay, now, uh, how about cancer? Something that, in fact, a few decades ago, people did not like to talk about it. Um, I mean, I know most of that from Mad Men, but, um, it, it, <laughs> no, I, people told me. Um, that I, well, I have a brother who has cancer. He's very sick right now. Um, but uh, it's fairly common to discuss it. I'm just curious, again, raise your hands if you would. Um, would you feel comfortable discussing cancer with somebody, say you work with, right? Somebody who you find at least semi-human that you can have an interaction with, that kind of thing. So pretty comfortable with that. Okay, so there's a number of things again. Cancer is a pretty big deal, pretty, pretty, pretty big deal. Um, now, you don't have to say if you have one, but I'm curious about how many of you would feel comfortable talking to your boss or a coworker about a mental health issue? So that, let's call that 15% and kind of a little fishy on that, right? Uh, how about, uh, well, I talked about a colleague. How about a family or, or a friend or a family member? You know, assume, let's assume that you actually get along with your family. Um, and uh, so how about a friend, you know, somebody you're close with? You pre feel pretty comfortable with it. Okay, well, there's a bunch of weirdos in Portland, I guess. But normally the percentage is lower. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, OK. So I think that's interesting. I want you to think about that in the context of what we discuss. Now, I'm going to talk about myself, because I am strangely open about these things. I have some diagnoses that I think are fairly accurate, having dealt with them for quite a long time. Uh, I've been diagnosed with a thing called generalized anxiety disorder. Um, I guess this would be different than just normal anxiety, in that it is typically more extreme uh, and happens for not an obvious reason. I have physical manifestations of that. I get 
uh, I'll get sick to my stomach. I get a lot of tension. It feels like I have a knot under my, the sternum in my chest. Uh, I used to have irritable bowel syndrome, and I think it was very tied to that. So I would poop a lot. Um, not super fun. Um, and I would get, I, and I'm often really scared to go to new places. I'm scared to do things where I don't feel like I understand the uh, rules or I don't understand the criteria that I'm supposed to follow. So I am terrified to do things like get on the bus. I don't like doing that because I'm afraid I'm going to do the wrong thing. Um, not really a typical reaction you should have. It's actually not that big a deal. But I do have those reactions, I guess, at inappropriate times. Now, I also have something called adult ADHD. Um, things that kind of manifest with that, so I, but things that you might expect that we all kind of think of. So there's actually a couple different varieties of ADHD, but um, I have a lot of trouble focusing sometimes. Um, I take medication to help with that, but uh, I tend to do a lot of avoidance of things that I don't want to do, like severe avoidance. Um, uh, I also get frustrated really easily. I have kind of a low frustration threshold, um, and my emotions can be really intense, and that's something that you see with a certain kind of ADHD. Um, and I think this actually kind of works with the anxiety disorder too, but I'm really, really good at constructing bad outcomes to things and then hyper-focusing on them. Um, and so I, that's something I'm really awesome at. Uh, and so I, an example would be like, uh, Hey, you know, I get a get a letter from say my manager or something. It's like it, an email. And he says, "Hey, I want to want to talk with you on uh, Monday when you get in." And I think that I we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna be uh, gonna lose my job, we're gonna lose our house, we're gonna be out of out everything. Everything's gonna be screwed. Everybody's gonna leave. I'm gonna be alone and in a live in a box. And that's what's gonna happen. And I and then. That is what I'm focused on. That's what I think I have. It is almost never that. I have not, most of the time, ended up living in a box. But the, uh, that, but I'm really good at constructing those outcomes. Um, so yeah. Now, I take some medication. I think I mentioned that. Um, I take four major medications, four main things that I take for to treat these things that I deal with. I take Lexapro, which is an SSRI. Um, it's the same family of stuff as Prozac. And Lexapro is just sort of a more recent variant of it. And most of those SSRIs are just trying to get rid of side effects from it. But it still works pretty well, or you know, effectively. I also take Boost Bar, which is um, uh, an anti-anxiety medication. There also seems to be some kind of, they think that it helps SSRIs be more effective. Whenever you read about like how these medications work, there's a lot of we think in it, um, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, I also take a thing called Stratera. Uh, Stratera is um, a very, very expensive medication because it's not generic. Um, I was on a high deductible plan for a while, and I was paying $300 for 30 uh, a, one, a month. Um, and uh, yeah, there's no generic for it. I think the actual, I saw the actual list price non-discounted is $500. I was only paying $300, so I was getting a good deal. Um, and uh, But uh, at least I could pay for it. Um, and Stratera is an, is an ADHD medication and is the only one on the market in the US that I know of, and I'm pretty sure else, that is not an amphetamine. Everything else to treat ADD or ADHD is an amphetamine. Um, strangely enough, my uh, psychiatrist said that a person with anxiety disorder should not take speed. So <laughs> actually kind of not, kind of not, not, not a great idea. And then clonopin is a tranquilizer. Uh, it is similar to Xanax or things like that. It, you know, cycles work a little differently and stuff like that. But it is, calms me down, take that as I need to. Um, those are the four things I take. And then I also see a therapist every two weeks. Um, and I talk about how and why I do the things that I do. And I try to come up with strategies to address those things. So I'm, I'm doing both those things. I'm taking medication. And I believe that I have this chronic issue. And medication is really important for me. Uh, to be able to have, get those things under control. At the same time, therapy is really helpful for me too. Um, and so I, if you ever talk to me, people come to me and say, hey, what should I do? Like, I know what you should do. I don't. Um, but I usually say, well, talk to these, but try to explore these different things. And I, I think that it is important to do those things. I think it's common that people will often say, oh, well, I'll just go to my, say, general practitioner, and I will get a prescription, and that will kind of help things. And kind of, but general practitioners aren't really trained in psychological issues, and so they don't, 
Uh, they're probably not, you should see a specialist, really, and then figure out your plan of attack on this stuff. Um, hey, my Fitbit started vibrating. Hey. Okay, I'm gonna slide over here. All right, yeah. <laughs> you wanna see it? Yeah, okay. But, here, let me. All right. So now I'm still, I'm still gonna have to reach across here and do this. Um, anyway, but one of the things that I think is really hard, the hardest about this is this feeling that I've had, and I had it for a long time since I was a kid, um, and really only recently I felt like I wasn't this way, was that you feel distinctly alone and like nobody else is like you because we generally don't talk about these kinds of things. And only recently, like in the last 10 years or so, did I start appreciating that actually it's really common to have these kinds of issues, and lots of people do, and we just don't talk about it. But I felt for a long time, oh, a good 20, years of my life that that was the case. Um, and junior high, high school, college, first 10 years of out of college, I really felt that way. And in that experience, I felt like I was broken. There was something wrong with me and I was never gonna be right. I was never gonna figure out how to work in society and be productive and things like that. And that loneliness, that feeling of isolation, even in a crowd full of people not knowing how to relate to them is just really crushing. And it was so difficult and so challenging for me. Um, and for so many other people who have it worse than I do. Um, and I think that it is the case that it, I'm not the only one, though that's what I found out, is I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people who deal with this stuff. So to talk a little bit about sort of the prevalence and how this affects us really as a society, and I'm gonna throw some statistics at you that sound fancy. But I just looked them up. It wasn't like I figured it out. Um, one in five adults uh, have a mental, across the board, I've looked at a few different things, but it's pretty consistent. About 20% of people in the US, adults in the US in any one year have some mental disorder that they're dealing with. Now, obviously that can vary a lot. Uh, anxiety disorders are the most common. People will deal with depression. Some people deal with eating disorders. Some people deal with, um, Things like schizophrenia, those, those kind of high-level psychological disorders, uh, and, and substance abuse will fall under that as well. Um, so that anxiety disorders are the most common, but you're talking about 20% of the population. That's a really, really high number. That's a high level of prevalence. Um, and we're talking about level of disability, and some of this stuff I got from this report in 2004 from the World Health Organization, which was one of the which was the last like really big global examination of prevalence of, of, of disease in general. Um, and they did a comparison of sort of like the level of disability that you experience with different kinds of mental disorders and, and, and compared that to physiological disorders. Uh, and so they compared the level of disability, moderate depression. It would be similar to multiple sclerosis or severe asthma, both of which we think that's pretty debilitating. Um, and severe depression, they compared that to quadriplegia and the level of disability that you have. The way that, and if you think about, if you're familiar with depression, severe depression, the way that they have a thing called motor retardation, which is why you feel like you don't want to move and you can't get out of bed and stuff like that. It's because your body is actually going through a thing where it's telling it, it's doing stuff that's making you feel that way. Um, so, and that falls into this thing called disease burden or there's a, all this part from the global burden of disease that World Health Organization study. And the disease burden metric is something that I had where they basically took premature death plus years live with a disability. And it's, the idea is to kind of me, try to measure the, again, the burden, the impact that a disease has on a society and has on different groups. And they measured a bunch of different groups uh, globally. And the, the burden of mental disorders was the largest of all disorder categories in North America. I mean, this, again, this is a 2004 study. It's more than cardiovascular disease, it was more than cancer. Now they're not, the mortality rate is quite a bit lower, like significantly lower. But the years live with disability and the impact that it has on people's ability to be relatively normal, productive members of society, however you choose to define that, or how it interferes with their ability to do that, is very, very high. Um, this is a quote from that study. It says, in all regions, neuropsychiatric conditions are the most important causes of disability, accounting for around one-third of years lost to disability among adults aged 15 years and over. That's in the entire world they measured that. Across the board, that was that high, which is a crazy number. Crazy, crazy, crazy number. More numbers, talking about economic costs, and if you really want to look it up, you can look at this link at the bottom, but just trust me. 
Um, so mental health conditions are the second leading cause of workplace absenteeism. And this is in the United States only. Um, workers with depression lose about 5.6 hours a week to that disorder, to that disease that they have, to that, that, uh, that illness. And workers without depression lose about 1.5 hours a week. But you can see it has a significant impact on their time available to work. Uh, and then depression, if you're just measuring numbers, that in absenteeism, I don't know, this stuff's going to be a little fuzzy, but let's throw out a big number, 43.7 billion absenteeism from work. So basically, you're talking about days that you lose because of just, and they're just looking at um, depression in this case. They're not talking about how the impact of anxiety disorders, they're not talking about this or that. This is just dealing with depression. So just one of the common mental disorders that people have. Um, and there's a, an enormous amount of lost time because of that lost productivity and time spent on treatment. Um, now, I did a survey last year called Mental Health and Tech Survey, which, um, and the stats that I have here are only people in the US and only non-self-employed folks, so people who have an employer. Um, and because the, no, the way I asked the questions, it got a little fuzzy, and I, it's harder to make conclusions based on outside the US because I was kind of biased towards people in the US and the kind of questions that I asked. And, and, and also, self-employed is a whole other thing because in the US, your workplace is really your primary conduit for healthcare and for most people, uh, and things are different for if you're self-employed and you have to figure out different stuff. Still very relevant, it's just these results, I'm only looking at those folks. Um, so that was about, what, 800 people, I think I had, who fit that category, who responded. So the first question would be, do you feel that your employer takes, or this is just a, one of a few questions that I'll go through, and there were more to it, but these are ones that I think were interesting. Do you feel that your employer takes mental health as seriously as physical health? So that's a question we asked. And we had yes was 49%, which was, oh, yeah, that's OK. But half of people said either they don't know, which don't know kind of would make me think no, or just said flat out no, that they don't believe they take it as seriously. Um, another question, do you think that discussing a health issue with your employer would have negative consequences? And we compared physical and mental health. We asked the same question about physical health condition, mental health condition. So physical health condition, people were pretty decidedly said no over three quarters. Um, maybe it was 20%, I guess you could figure out. It's like, hey, you know, I broke my hand. Um, that's a bummer, you can't work. Um, and then all, yes was only 4%. So if we look at mental health, no was only 36%, maybe 41%. Yes, decidedly there would be negative consequences is almost a quarter. That there's certain there's gonna be consequences. And if you look at it, you're talking about almost two thirds were maybe or yes. So only a third of people were convinced that there wasn't gonna be a negative consequence. And I think that's quite a stark difference. Um, and the second thing, uh, would you bring up a health issue with a potential employer in an interview? I get asked this question a lot. What do I, how do I deal with this in interviews? You know, I'm trying to evaluate essentially whether this employer is gonna be a jerk about stuff or not, or they're gonna take me seriously. So would you bring up this health issue? Physical, no, 44%, not kind of not surprising, especially depends on the physical issue, but maybe 44%, yes, it's 12%. Um, so there's some, I can understand where you might not want to bring that up. Uh, it is illegal to, um, to uh, uh, what's the word, uh, to be prejudiced against somebody, to deny someone employment unless it would actually make them unable to do the job. It is illegal under the Americans with Disability Act to deny them employment on that basis. But proving that is extremely hard. Um, with mental health, um, twice as many people said no. Only, I have to read that, 2% said yes. Only 2% said yes. Um, I think that is very clearly shows the stigma that you're dealing with. Um, a couple of things we'll go through here quickly. Do you know the options for mental health care your employer provides? Yes, 40%, okay. But still, you're talking about three-fifths of people, I would say not sure, kind of sounds like no. Um, or no, uh, three-fifths of people did not know what mental health care options your employer provides. Does your employer provide resources to learn more about mental health issues and how to seek help? 26% uh, said yes, so about a quarter. Almost everybody else said don't know or no, absolutely not. 
they don't provide us any resources about that. But think about that in the context of what we looked at in terms of the prevalence. It's extremely high and has an ex a very high impact on worker productivity. Um, so, you know, let alone just being a nice person to people and wanting them to be happy and healthy, uh, it, it, there's almost no information provided for that. Is your anonymity protected if you choose to take advantage of mental health or substance abuse treatment resources? Yes, it's 3%, that's good. Almost nobody knows. You know, over two thirds have no idea. Don't know if their anonymity would be protected. How easy is it for you to take medical leave for a mental health condition? This is a question I get asked a lot too about how to deal with that. Over half people don't know. They just don't know. They don't know if it's okay or not. Um, very easy, 13%. Probably that's come up. They know it's okay. They know it's okay with their boss. They know their organization, that's in their values. Somewhat easy, 18%. Somewhat difficult, very difficult. There's a couple there, but you know, you're talking about about two thirds, let's say, who don't know or believe it will be very difficult to do that, um, would be able to take time off. So I, what I've seen anecdotally is people just lie about it. They say, oh, I'm going to the doctor. They don't say, I'm going, oh, I'm going to the psychiatrist or my therapist. Or they say, I don't feel well. Well, you know, it doesn't mean that they have the cold or a cold or flu or something like that. They, they just don't tell people what's going on. At the end of the day, Sick workers don't work. People who are not well do not work as well. Or they're significantly less productive. And in only 41% of people in the US with a mental disorder receive professional help in a given year. Only 41%. So the amount of time that's being, that, that people are actually going out there to seek treatment, is that the number is very low. Now, with people with depression, Half the people who seek help for depression wait eight years or more. And it is harder, the longer the delay, the more difficult recovery is because you're not doing anything. And it typically gets worse and worse and worse. People with mental health problems also are more likely to seek help if someone close to them suggests it. But what we see from that information is that in the workplace, again, a time where you spend probably most of your waking hours, unfortunately, or a lot of them, and it's also, again, your primary conduit for healthcare, and a lot of healthcare information comes through the workplace. Probably most of it, if not all of it, comes through that. Um, people don't get help. They're afraid to talk about it. So that's really disturbing, um, and I think a very, very big problem. Now, there's some things we identified about making your workplace safe. And when I talk about that, I really mean trying to make your workplace safer to have discussions about mental health issues. And that doesn't mean it's safe to you necessarily have to be this person where it's like, yeah, I'm going to go up. I've got this thing going on. I'm going to tell everybody. And, you know, that's your business. You don't have to tell anybody if you don't want to. And I've heard people very well, you know, well-meaning people, I've done talks with and things like that who've talked about mental health stuff and they've said, I think you should never talk to anybody about mental health issues because I'm afraid that you're gonna have, in your workplace, you shouldn't bring it up, it's not their business. I can understand why they say that because they had bad experiences. Um, but we try to identify a few different things that would help try to make that workplace a little bit safer. And the first thing is really to get buy-in from sea levels um, uh, sorry, as I get older, I keep using dumb terms like sea level and synergy and crap like that. I've been saying actionable information a lot lately. It's really upsetting. Um, <laughs> uh, in hierarchical organizations, and most social groups really, because they tend to have some sort of hierarchy to them with human beings, Values come from the top down. So the things that are valued by the people at the top of that hierarchy are going to become the values of that organization, period. It is very difficult to get values to come from the bottom up. That's why it is so important, and the number one most important thing to do is if you want to change the way that your organization uh, treats this kind of stuff, if you want to change what they value and what they view as important and what's okay and what's not okay, you have to get buy-in from top-level folks. 
That means meeting with executives, sharing research, sharing information on laws, stuff like that, sharing ways to support employees. And those are things like discourage work hour martyrdom. <laughs> it's like a good term, I thought. Uh, you should actively discourage people working long hours. You should actively encourage them to take vacations. Um, you should enforce vacation before it's needed. Uh, because if you are, if you get to the point where you're like, I really need a vacation, you should have had a vacation already. Um, you have to talk about, you know, they make sure that they have coverage for mental health. There has to be transparency in the hiring process and company practices. This stuff should come up in the interview. And you have to deal with kind of wellness strategies and stuff like that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to do in that way. But that's, those are the basic outlines for what you try to do when you're trying to talk with folks who are on a C-level, because those are the things they're concerned about. You have to show them research. You have to sh talk with them about what the legal th ramifications are. Because one of the big concerns they're going to run into with anything is, uh, what's, what could happen to me legally if I know something or if I make a mistake? This comes up a lot with managers. And so it's important to address those things. Um, unfortunately, it's also one of the hardest things to do is to get that C-level stuff, but I think it's possible. Uh, the second thing I think is really important is to take mental health first aid, and I really strongly feel that like, you have to get all your execs, all your managers and HR people, in this order, execs, managers, HR people, and then employees. Um, I've taken mental health first aid. Uh, it took, it's about, it's a day-long class about in the US, uh, it took eight hours. Uh, sometimes they can split that up. It is really cheap to do. It cost me $50 out of my pocket, and I think it was a little more expensive than it is in some places. You know, Some places you can find a place to do it for free. Uh, so it's really cheap, and honestly, I think you use it way more than traditional first aid, which is also useful. It is helpful to know how to, say, revive a person and compress their chest and things like that. But you're going to use this way more. And it really teach at the end of the day, it teaches you how to interact with somebody who is dealing with, it may be a crisis, it may be not, but it helps you evaluate if they're in a crisis situation and helps you then interact with them in an effective way. Not to solve their problem for them, but to help assist them in getting help. And it teaches you how to do that in an effective way. So I really, really advocate it. I feel strongly about it. I think it's a really, really good course that everybody should take. I think it's really important to know your local resources. Um, it's important for organizations to research community resources. There is not a Yelp for mental health services in the United States. It is, you got to go to the people who have boots on the ground in your community and figure out what it is, because there is not some national registry for every place that has like, you know, group discussion therapy and you know, can help people who uh, with, with get treatment and who does sliding scale stuff and therapy wise and who doesn't. There is not that information on a national level. There's some stuff like that, but there are way more resources that if you're not plugged into the community sort of network of resources, you have no idea if they exist. So it's really important that your organization research those community resources and compile them all in one place. Make those available to your employees. <sighs> Knowing your coverage is really, really important. And really, at the end of the day, it's, it's about making mental health coverage transparent. It shouldn't be hidden. It shouldn't be something that's in a 100-page you know, handbook that you hand to somebody and then never talk about again. Um, it's important that you, the company actively disclose the benefits plan, uh, give that information, and then give an opportunity for everybody to meet with an insurance rep and get their questions answered about stuff in a non-judgmental environment, either one-on-one, -on -one, or in a group session or what have you, but it's very, very important at the end of the day to be very transparent about what's available in terms of insurance coverage and things like that. And then the fifth thing, and this is the largest thing, really is actively engaging and educating. And there's really three aspects to this. There's awareness, which is really people coming in kind of like me at the beginning of this talk and talking about some of the stuff that I've dealt with. And this talk was primarily an awareness talk at first, and has kind of evolved to some extent to have more information in it. But there's a uh, MH prompt, mentalhealthprompt.org. MH prompt is uh, a group uh, that I've worked with that gets folks uh, uh, in the, who are familiar specifically with the tech and developer uh, uh, communities uh, to come and speak at conferences, to speak at businesses, and things like that. Um, a big part of your awareness, a big way to do that awareness, is to have somebody come in and talk about it, somebody who's willing to. Not everybody has to be as, uh, you know, out there like I am about this stuff, but um, you know, not everybody has to do that. 
but it is really helpful to have somebody who comes up and is willing to talk about it because I think it makes everybody feel a little bit better about it. I feel a little less alone. I feel a little less isolated. Um, there's the resources portion of that, which includes things like local resources where we talked about knowing what those resources are and being able to provide them in an easy in one place. Um, finding online stuff, uh, finding tools and things like that. There's a bevy of, if you have iOS, I haven't looked at Android. Um, on iOS, there's a bevy of tools for dealing with different kinds of common mental health issues, anxiety disorders and things like that, for tracking kinds of things, for doing breathing or examining behavior patterns or things like that. Some of those things are good, some of those things, you know, maybe they're not so good, but you try to you know, evaluate what those things are and, and make sure that people know about them. And then promotion of wellness is that kind of stuff. If you ever worked at a larger company and they send around stuff where it's like, hey, we're gonna all jog, right? <laughs> Don't forget to take the stairs eat, and eat fiber. Well, it's the same kind of crap. It's just it's about mental health stuff. Um, it's the same kind of stuff, though, really. It's getting people to start thinking about these things and talking about it openly, where you're doing education, maybe in a public forum. You're talking about, well, these are things that I'm dealing with. Like, if you have anxiety disorders, there are some patterns and some treatments that are really effective for helping people either cope or dramatically reducing or eliminating um, uh, the, the symptoms that they have. Um, being able to teach techniques and best practices, talking about you know breathing exercises or doing yoga or things, you know all sorts of things that that have proven to be effective for some people. Um, support groups are a big one. Um, if you have a large enough group, you may you're probably going to be able to, you'd probably be able to put together a support group where you talk about like well these are people with substance abuse disorders, these are folks with uh, attention issues, these are folks with anxiety disorders, these are people who deal with depression or things like that. Um, and if those support groups aren't you don't know, can't do them internally. You probably can find things, especially in a larger area, metro area like this, you can find those things in local groups. Um, and really to promote proactive practices that often help with mental health issues. They don't help with all of them, but they help with a lot of the common ones, which are to do things like getting outside and exercising a little and things like that. Um, that I'm not going to tell you. There are going to be some people who are like, one time I saw somebody who was like, I want to talk about mental health issues. And the key is to drink more water. And I, that's OK. I'm glad it worked for you. That's awesome. I actually find I do feel better when I drink water. That's why I drink it all the time. And also, I take medication that makes me really thirsty. <laughs> but uh, you know, yeah, I do feel better with that. It doesn't mean it's a panacea for everybody. You're going to solve all their problems. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's what they call uh, but, um, cure advocacy. A key thing, if this ever comes up to you, and it's a little bit slightly off topic from what I'm saying here, is that if you are in a position where somebody's talking about something that they're dealing with, do not try to tell them how to fix it, because that, you are not qualified to do that. Does anybody here have a master's or PhD in psychiatry or has a medical doctor in psychiatry? Anybody here? OK, you should not give advice on how to solve people's problems uh, in, in psychological issues. Uh, you can maybe tell them how to you know, fix that problem in their JavaScript code. That's go to town, brother. But uh, you should not, you're not qualified to do that. And you can do a lot of harm because if they try it and it doesn't work, that is often incredibly discouraging. So it, you really want to be careful about what you say and what you do and how you say it. You want to be encouraging, but you know, that, take that mental health first aid. It tells you exactly how to do this stuff, and it's really helpful. So. Um, We've been doing a fundraiser this year. Uh, open sourcing mental illness is kind of the general term for this thing I've been doing for a couple of years. And in 2015, we had to do some fundraising again because um, some corporate policies changed and, and the, the prompt campaign was uh, had to look again for, for support. And they had been helping me uh, go out to, to conferences and paying for travel and stuff like that. Um, some conferences do cover those kinds of things and don't need us great, but some of them don't. Um, and so I needed to do fundraising again to pay for travel to go to a place like this because it ends up costing me about $1,500, right? And it's kind of hard sometimes to get that scratched together. So I had a goal of $5,000 that would probably get me to two or three of these. Um, so that was, my goal was $5,000. And we reached that goal, that time to goal, we reached that in two hours. And that was humbling and super awesome. 
Uh, so, and we just finished the, we actually ended up doing a second campaign for, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Cake PHP framework, but they had a conference. They also, I did a second smaller campaign just for them. But both of these were on Indiegogo. So if we add that all up, total raise, and that just ended and that, um, about uh, just a few days ago, the total raise was $13,600. <laughs> Which was scary. It is scary when people are like, eh, sure, just take this money. <laughs> and what am I supposed to do with it? Um, but we do actually have some ideas. Uh, um, with this extra money, one of the big things we're going to do is create some of that actionable information um, to basically develop documentation for making work, tech workplaces safer for folks with mental health issues. And to, those five things we talked about, what we're going to do is we're going to flesh that stuff out. And I can actually pay for people who are re actually trained in this and who have actually done this kind of work in, in organizational psychology and uh, psychiatry backgrounds and things like that. Um, and so we can do that, and that's really awesome. I'm really excited about it. So what I really need is I need your help to keep talking about this and keep sharing this and learning about this stuff and talk and email and tweet and post. Do it now or keep listening to me and do it in a minute. Um, but if anything I've shown here, if these URLs or messages or words have been useful, if you want to look at slides, resources, videos, and I try to videotape all my talks, um, they're at this funkatron.com slash OSMI. Did I spell that right? I do that, I, I often say O-M-S-I every time to the point where I actually had to set up a redirect to correct that in my uh, web server because I mistype it so much. And then if you want donations, you can, there's actually the, the campaign, the primary campaign has ended, but Indiegogo has this thing now where you can do ongoing donations to a thing. So that JMP link will get you to it, OSMI 2015, um, if you want to throw some cash at that and get a t-shirt or something like that. Anyway, I also I want to say thank you to a couple people, Camille Wilson, Johanna Wu, Jerry Cody designed the logo. Uh, she is a really, really awesome designer. And uh, she took a cut rate to help me out with this, and that was really, really cool. Uh, so she designed the logo that we're using for this, which is super awesome. And Jennifer Cooley, uh, she works at Keen IO, and um, she is going to be helping me with developing a lot of these materials, and hopefully with maybe a couple other people. And there's so many other people. We had like, what, 130 contributors. Um, and one of these days, I'm going to get a whole list of a big wall of text with all of them on here. So. I want to say thank you for listening. Thank you for having me here. Um, again, there's a links to uh, where you can get the talks and videos, or if you want to give money, you can. But you don't have to give money. Just talk about it. That'd be really awesome. So that's basically the spiel. And that's what I got for you today. So. Thanks. <laughs>